Thank you, Patricia, for sitting down to talk with me today. Um, I thought we would start with um, me just asking you about this really interesting part of your, your past, um, 20 years that you spent living um, in an intentional community, mm -hmm. Oroville in mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I would just start by asking you sort of how, how you arrived there, how you got there, and, and what it was like, what it, what it meant to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got there in a way inadvertently. I had traveled by myself overland to India because I just wanted to get to India. And I went down Khyber Pass, I went into India, and I just felt at home. It was like a mother. It's something just welcomed me. I felt so at home there. So I stayed there, I'd met people, I was traveling around, and then someone I knew said, they were going down to Pondicherry, which is where that was a French colony. And wouldn't I come down and just meet him? And I said, sure. So I got on a train and went down there. And anyway, long story, that's where this project called Oroville had just started. Mm -hmm. And it was thousands of acres of pretty much nothing, like just devastated, ecologically devastated dirt. And there are about 200 people scattered all around <clears throat> this huge area with the aspiration to build a city of human unity. And, but what we were doing then was taking crowbars and digging in the dirt to plant trees and, and building thatched huts and things like that. So I really got in on the bottom ground where it was a it was a pioneering place. We really were pioneers. We had nothing um, and except our ideals. Mm -hmm. And so I wound up staying 20 years, wow. although that pioneering stage maybe la lasted less than 10, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested um, in the sort of either philosophical or spiritual side, so a community of human unity. Mm -hmm. um, was it based on certain teachings, or can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. It was based on the philosophy of a um, very well-known, um, I guess all over the world, but certainly in India, um, philosopher Kum Yogi, they called him, called Sri Aurobindo, mm -hmm. who had been educated at Cambridge, and he was an intellectual, and he wrote a lot. But he, his philosophy was what inspired it and this idea of um, action like it wasn't he didn't envisage some kind of path where you sat and meditated or anything like that it was like something you had to act in the world it was a very dynamic thing mm -hmm. so anyway that developed into this idea to to try to bring people from all over the world um, to this piece of land, and one of the founding principles of it was that it belonged to nobody in particular. Mm -hmm. And people came from all over the world and, and did that, very idealistic, mm -hmm. but not an ashram, nothing, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So I have more questions about that, but, mm -hmm. but I, I maybe right yeah. now I'll, um, because at St. John's, we do, um, you know, we don't talk about, I don't think in most of our program works, thinking about a utopia or thinking about an intentional community, mm -hmm. but certainly the political philosophy we read. Yeah. There are many authors, um, you know, the first being Plato mm -hmm. and his mm -hmm. and the Republic, thinking about sort of an ideal human political community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious about how you're thinking um, about those that text in particular, or any of the texts, the political philosophy that we read, sort of interact with your, both your experience there mm -hmm. and, um, and the philosophy itself. I mean, one thing, one particular thing I was thinking about was, it seems that um, for Plato, but I think for other political philosophers too, there's some notion of the human being at root sort of mm -hmm. what the human being mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and therefore what an ideal human community 
must look like. Yeah. So whether we're thinking about the rational animal or a self-interested being mm -hmm. or a kind of the possibility of, um, or pity, I'm thinking about Rousseau, natural mm -hmm. pity, there are these different deep character traits that end up being central to what the human being is. Mm -hmm. And then a thinker will elaborate and say, and this is the way we might put together mm -hmm. a human community to, to most make that thrive. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, as to make the, the question more particular, um, whether the principle of the human being, if you find that resonates with the sort of Western philosophy we read or diverges in any way, mm -hmm. um, that's, a, I think, one way into thinking about a comparison between mm -hmm. your um, sort of experience there mm -hmm. and, and the way we think about these problems at St. John's. Yeah, when I, um, when I left India, it was to come back to America, to go to St. John's, to go to the Graduate Institute. I had been, before I had done that, I had I had gotten a master's degree at Johns Hopkins. I was at UCLA studying linguistics, and then I left and went to India. And when I found out about the Graduate Institute at St. John's, I thought, that's what I want to do, to get back to the West. And I think one of the very first texts that really moved me deeply was The Republic. Mm -hmm. And Plato in general, but particularly The Republic. And um, I was just thinking about that the other day and how, how Socrates says that this 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 city or whatever this ideal thing will not be achieved um, until until human beings get an erotic love for philosophy, he says, mm -hmm. and only then can cities, constitutions, and individuals become perfect. And that sounded to me like a description of what I had been trying to live. So mm -hmm. that, has, that has always stayed with me. And when I wrote a master's essay in Annapolis, I wrote it about the Bhagavad Gita, which is a very seminal text, Sanskrit text, and the Republic, not, not comparing them, but talking about resonances mm -hmm. in them, because I really felt there was um, so that is the first text, yeah. text yeah. that comes to my mind. So let's let's work on that a little. Okay. I love I love that the erotic love for philosophy mm. as the grounds for an ideal human community. Yeah, I of course that resonates very much with me. It's <laughs> yeah. also why I am at St. John's. But um, I do think there are places where we have to negotiate this relationship to philosophy on the one hand and to the political on the other. Yeah. And it's not always smooth, right? So no. there's this sense in which the conventional political reality, that what sort of, I think of political science and mm -hmm. what would make mm -hmm. that sort of mechanism work or, or machinery of political life work. Mm -hmm. Often, I feel like in the texts we read, that is put a little bit, not at odds, but in tension with the philosophical life mm -hmm. so that Facing the truth at each and every moment might not be always conducive to a sort of group living. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, I think about Socrates being put to death. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah. he is not entirely compatible with the city, mm. and we're made to ask, "What is it about philosophy? Is he actually corrupting the youth? Is that an accurate uh -huh. claim in uh -huh. some way that uh -huh. that to be deeply philosophic?" means to be unconventional and how do we how do we put those two things together smooth societal living on the one hand and on the other a kind of pursuit of truth that might not always fit easily in yeah yeah, yeah. and i i don't know whether you, you know you want me to keep to go back to india but i, I would say i i lived for those two decades in india um, trying to figure out that question. I think I and the hundreds of people that were there mm -hmm. um, were, were trying to ask that question and see if it would work. And it didn't always work. Mm -hmm. It didn't always work. For one thing, the idea of, um, well, I think of Rousseau that the first time a person came and took a piece of land and said, this is mine, mm -hmm. something was lost. Mm -hmm. And that 
Um, so the ideal that nothing belonged to anyone in particular, that doesn't really work. <laughs> People aren't like that. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I had very little, it was my bicycle. You know, it was my house. And so how do you, how do you negotiate that? And and um, and I would say it's still an uh, it's still an ongoing thing. I don't know if it's ever been solved, but the the adventure of trying to do that is worth it. Yeah, I think it has to happen. I mean, people have there have to be some people trying to yeah. do that. No, it's really interesting because I think one of the things that I think about reading Plato is mm. something about the city and speech. Yeah versus an actual city. Right. And I think I leave the Republic worrying about that or wondering about mm -hmm. it. And also sort of in our own pursuits in the world, the role that something like a city in speech might have for us. In other words, an image of a beautifully knit sort of peaceful human community, mm -hmm. the fact that it may bump up against truths about human beings that, that make it hard to actually realize. I wonder about having it as an ideal <laughs> that we're striving for, mm -hmm. and in some way, it gets tricky, this idea of, I wouldn't want to, I think there's a cop out there if I say, well, the city in speech is useful because I can strive for it, even if I know somewhere in the back of my mind we will always only be living in approximation. Yeah. I, I want to be able to uh, it's a question for me in so much of what we do. I mean, I'm doing senior seminar, <clears throat> excuse me, this year, and and with Marx, you know, or other highly idealistic yeah. thinkers, where you're brought all the way to the edge, and then you think, but would it be a human being on the other side of that final revolution? Yeah. Um, and I don't still know how to put that together. Mm. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm rambling a little, but I, the city and speech ideas. Is it enough to say, well, we'll always be approximating it and we have to hold out an ideal, but we kind of know it could never happen. So a kind of philosophical or poetic lighthouse or sort of guiding light, mm. but, but being not resigned to, but realistic in some way. Or is that a cop out and that we should strive fully and that we could, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, 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 that. yeah. That, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. It seems to me, that if if one goes into asking that question, having decided that um, it'll never really be attained, but mm -hmm. we have to strive for it, means that you'll never attain it. Mm -hmm. That there has to be some kind of, um, if not certitude, uh, um, the courage to say that could happen mm -hmm. and to put yourself on the line. <laughs> you know, to work towards that. However, it's not, I mean, I think that's why I've wound up in the St. John's community mm -hmm. and I've never, because I tend to be extremely disillusioned by politics, the world situation, and, and it, 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 it's painful yeah. to see how we are failing as human beings at, at, at doing that. And yet at the same time, I'm always so acutely aware of um, we have to think that it could happen, right? Mm -hmm. Even in America, if you look at the ideals that America was founded on, mm -hmm. well, I mean, we're far from, you know, we're, we're fighting over them more than ever. And yet those ideals are, in, in their purity, it seems to me, ought to be held to. Um, and that, that's something to strive towards. Yeah. It's something to strive towards. It's interesting that you bring it to America also in yeah. senior seminar. I'm going through the sort of American founding sequence. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking about Du Bois. Um, I'm so mm -hmm. moved by the souls of black folk. I yeah. think that book is incredible. Um, and I think he does this really interesting thing where certain chapters feel heavy on something like political philosophy, political mm -hmm. science, or sociology, very mm -hmm. grounded in sort of data and, and rational argument for what living in America should look like, mm -hmm. based on, I think, philosophical principles that, that are essential to America's founding. Mm -hmm. And in other chapters, there are stories that are told that are moving, mm -hmm. you know, move you to tears. Mm -hmm. And I think he even says at some point that the way this human community will really come to fruition is a combination of something like intellect and 
compassion or mm-hmm. heart. Yeah, and and, and heart. that it makes me want to ask you about heart. Like yeah. when I think when you say you have to really believe, I feel like the kind of work we often do is is philosophic, rational work, trying to understand again what is it at base the human being, and then what would it mean to put human beings together such that those sort of most essential parts of what we are thrive. And that's an intellectual philosophical puzzle. Mm. But that feels very different from the experience of weeping (laughs) when the sun dies and, and Du Bois says something like, maybe it's better because the world he was coming into would have made his life terrible you know mm. and that, that what that what happens to me it makes me, I feel like whatever happens to me in that moment is probably more conducive to true human community than any set of thoughts yeah 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 I think I think that's true and and that's why that um when I read um, Socrates saying that this erotic love of philosophy that those those two things have to somehow find a way together I mean again I'll give you a specific example mm-hmm. where um, in this community where I lived, it was surrounded by very impoverished villages um, of people that um, had very little education, had almost no possessions, um, had a lot of children. Um, and those of us who were there, mainly Western, a lot of French people, we we felt that these people are the first members of our community. They're the first members. But how did we, how could we, how could we deal with them? How could we love them? Mm -hmm. And they wound up doing the physical work because that was what they could do and they needed the money. Mm -hmm. But it it created, again, this kind of tension, like how do we, how do we live together really? I I think that's what you're asking. How Mm -hmm. do we put this into practice? How Mm -hmm. do how do we look at someone and, and weep? Right. And were there elements of um, the sort of common teaching, say, of Sri Aurobindo mm-hmm. that addressed that in a way? Maybe that's just different from the way we might think about it. Well, the first thing that, that comes to mind, but it's a little hard to... Um, it's a little hard to express because it it, it shouldn't sound like um, <laughs> Aristotle's idea of the natural slave or something like that. But I th- I think there was one a very deep notion of every human being finding their their place or their mm-hmm. in Sanskrit their dharma their rule of their rule of life, and that if that would happen there would be that kind of harmony. Mm-hmm. But not meaning that some people are meant to be servants and some people are meant to be, um, you know, the receivers of everything. Nothing like, nothing like that. Um, he, he wrote a lot of political stuff. Um, he was very interested in the political mm-hmm. and, and not a pacifist at all. He had been very active in the Indian um, independence movement, had actually been arrested for violent political action, mm-hmm. um, things like that. So I, I, I think it was, um, I've always said this before, but an extremely dynamic way of figuring out these questions that they have to be lived. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you, of course, you try to base it on some ideals or something that you find within yourself, which is almost by definition a private project. But that if if, if it's not, if you don't force yourself to, to accept that adventure, and it's, I think it's a painful adventure, actually. No, nothing, will ha- nothing will happen. It's, um, I, I don't know if that, if that really yeah. makes sense at all. Say, I think I understand, but say a little bit more why a painful adventure. Um, well, <laughs> you see yourself failing all the time, mm-hmm. and you see the community failing all the time. I mean, you see, you see, um, for instance, this um, 
this Rousseauian idea of putting a fence around something and saying that this is mine. And you see, we do that constantly. Well, we, and we have to do that. That's what it means to be a human being, right? But we can listen to Marx, mm -hmm. but I can say from my experience, pure communism doesn't work. We, we don't share that way. It just does not, it does not work. Well, how do we find, what if, you, what if you begin with a blank slate and you're thrown together with hundreds of people and told you to do it, try to figure it out? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, so I think we can um, maybe uh, try to live that endeavor any, anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah, I, so we might um, be inclined to sort of separate the theoretical thinking through the problem mm -hmm. versus the active mm -hmm. working on the problem. Right, right. But as you were speaking, I had the thought of, you know, the blank slate, you have a bunch of people, you get together, and this is probably romanticized. But <laughs> I think about St. John's and what it means to be in the classroom. Mm. And aside from the particular issues we're working out intellectually, what it means to be together in that particular kind of way. Mm. I think mm. maybe in my experience, and it might just be who I am and that I connect to people that way, but there is something about that philosophical activity yeah. that feels like it escapes many problems mm. that might arise. Um, what I just, how do you, what do you think about that? Could philosophic activity be part action and not just do, do you know what I Oh yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah, I think I think it our classrooms at St. John's are action, mm -hmm. I would think. I mean, that's why I came to St. John's. Mm -hmm. I I thought I came to America and I came into contact with St. John's and I thought that's where I belong. Mm -hmm. That's where I belong. Um it, it's a community that's a, attempting to do this. I mean, through through education, but the, what happens in the seminar room when, when we all really um, uh, uh, together accept that endeavor? I mean, you know how it is. It's yeah. it's it's so inspiring and so and so beautiful. Yeah. Did you have anything like that in India? Was there a practice of? Uh, something other than work together, kind of thinking together, or discuss, you know, was there any kind of dialectical? Oh yeah, yeah. We met all the, we met all the time to figure out what in the world we were going to do, mm -hmm. and I think as the place developed, um, I wound up being the head of an international high school there. Um, I I taught. I taught students who eventually came back. One of my favorite students came back, went to Harvard. He, he, you know, publishes all, all over the place. I mean, there, I would say the opportunities there, particularly for the children, um, were really dynamic and, and they were important. So education became very, very, very important mm -hmm. there. So that, yeah, that's one place for both of adults and, and of children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you can't um, you can't fudge that, can you, in the classroom? Mm -hmm. If you're honest, you can't, unless you lecture. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a sense. I mean, I don't wholly agree with this, but I do definitely think there's a sense at St. John's sometimes for some students of sort of being up on the hill, talking about philosophy, talking about all these problems, but not doing anything. Mm. And, and that's not entirely untrue insofar as one might be tempted to sort of get so involved in the arguments, they're beautiful, you mm. know, that you might, that might be enough I, I'm not sure if I even believe that, but I, I at least want to bring that up in terms of, do you see it that way? Or can you imagine um, this doctrine of, of action? You know, I don't think, at least at first blush, we would say that about St. John's, although mm -hmm. I do think that the kind of action in the classroom is vital yeah. for real community of any kind. You have mm -hmm. to talk to each other. You yeah. have to listen. You have to work on things together mm -hmm. towards an end that is not just self-interested. All of those, that kind of practice. But nonetheless, how do you think about a critique that a student might say, yeah, we're up here, we're talking about all these books, but we're not really doing we're anything. Not, we're not really 
living real life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I know what I've said to myself all along, what, what happens to myself all along. Whatever I'm reading, I tend to completely fall into and think, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> now that's right. And then, of course, you go home and you, and you, and, and you watch how that expresses itself in the world, right? I mean, and then you start, and then things start falling into place and you know that some voices speak louder, but I, maybe it's because I'm older than the students. I mean, I'm an adult, but it seems to me that what we do has such a dynamic application to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I, I've had students who have left and said, I had one student who I, he was, he was wonderful. And he said, I, I've just got to leave. I want to be a truck driver. So I said, go for it. And so he went and became a truck driver. He just couldn't. And I'm sure that he's going to maybe be a great truck driver or one day he'll yeah. continue his education. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think in, in general, that's what I would say, uh, I think, to the students is, what you're reading and what you're doing at the table is this is education for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. it's really education for life and we can practice it here. We practice it here and we don't always do a good job, right? Yeah. yeah. We don't always do a good job. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about what you were saying about people's dharma, I guess mm -hmm. is the word, mm -hmm. and that idea of finding your place. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I'm just curious about it. It relates to what we're talking about, but I'm also just would like to talk about it a little more, mm -hmm. um, sort of in that that tradition, what that means. Because I do think both St. John's students, but I think young people in the world right now, mm -hmm. that notion of finding fit and a fit that is not just sort of financial fit or a prestigious fit, but a deep fit in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that this is really what you should be doing yeah. with your life. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit more? About, I don't know. I, I wonder. <laughs> you're asking me to be a guru or yeah, something. Yeah, or just. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Again, I, I guess I, when you were speaking, I the first thing that comes to my mind is that the great... Um, the great text of, of Dharma is the Mahabharata, which is, um, well, it's 10 times about the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. It's a big, it's a big thing. But um, that c concept is very central there. And, and I just to speak about um, the Bhagavad Gita, which is just one little chapter in this giant thing, but that the main, that the main character who is faced with a battlefield and the text calls it the field of battle and the field of dharma and puts down his bow and says, no, war is wrong. Those are, those are my brothers out there. I'm not, I cannot kill them. That's wrong. And his, the, the driver of his chariot, who is, the, who is Krishna, is, but his buddy, spends all this time saying, no, you're dharmas. You're a warrior. Get out there and kill. Wow. And convinces him by the end, and he picks up his bow and he goes and he goes into battle, and um, and so that I think that's an example, you know, and that's hard. Imagine because you think um, being a pacifist yeah. is probably much more spiritual than being a, being an archer in the you know, and in this case, I mean, he's told no, but that isn't that's not your dharma. That's, yeah, and yeah. I mean what you said earlier about it being painful. I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly, but that that that's, right there. That's an example. Yeah. yeah, that's an example. I believe me. I'm not <laughs> encouraging <laughs> more or anything like that. Yeah. But that's such an acute, I think, acute example, um, and it it's throughout this this incredible text. But that yeah. that's a moment that mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean it. It speaks the idea of self knowledge, which is yeah. so sort of foregrounded yeah. In, yeah. in the works we read. Yeah. But it, it gives a particular cast to it that is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, something about knowing yourself and being honest with... Well, I, I wonder about... 
sort of American ideology about like we can do whatever we want, <laughs> you know, like strive <laughs> yeah. hard enough. And, yeah. and I think there's something beautiful about that mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. the, the notion of we are not predetermined and we have an, a sort of we can discover ourselves along the way. Yeah. Although maybe that's not that different. Ultimately, if you're discovering yourself, God, is it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. I think the um, that that's hard. That's really hard. How do you how do you take the the project of discovering who you are, your dharma, or something like that, um, by simply um, allowing yourself complete liberty? I think sometimes that can damage the soul. Mm -hmm. So the the ability to discriminate in in these things I think is so important, and sometimes I think that's a little bit a, a concept that's that's getting lost. Mm -hmm. You're you're uptight, or you're I, you know, yeah. uh, but yeah, I. You can't, in a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a puzzle because you can't find yourself unless you begin by, um, in a way, finding yourself, putting boundaries, I mean, not boundaries in a good way, putting a, put a, a definition on yourself and not, not doing damage to your soul before you, um, before you figure, it, figure that out before you figure out. I hope I'm not sounding like an old grandma or no. something. I don't mean it that way because yeah. my life has been completely, uh, you know, I wouldn't even tell a lot of the details of my life. <laughs> yeah. But I, I know, you know, I, I think I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, I want to talk about it a little more because okay. I think it's I think it is a tension and mm -hmm. the idea of self-discovery and an openness and even sort of not just enthusiasm but what it means to be alive for the short time that we are here yeah. the idea of coming close to something like our dharma I think that is shared with I'm thinking about my son, but also our yeah. students. Like, yeah. that's what, what people, you know, right. find out who mm. they are. Mm. But this notion of the violence to the soul, that's really interesting. Mm. And I wonder if, I don't know if you have any examples, but the idea of putting these boundaries on, the way I'm thinking about it is um, sort of the hard work it takes to really commit to something. And that if I am too open mm -hmm. and sort of try, well, I'm going to try this and try this. I'm going to find myself in that right. way. If, like there's a lot of opportunity, lots of stuff. It'll it'll show itself when I land on the right mm -hmm. thing. Might miss something about what really hard work that a single thing requires. That yeah. is there some of that in what you're saying, or would you characterize it in a different way? I, I'm, I, yeah. No, I, I no that that sounds that sounds right. I think you um, you have to try to know. I mean, without giving details, I know myself that I reached a I, I reached an, an edge in my life, you could say, where I was I, I was really on on the edge of just saying I'll do anything. I'll ex I'll try anything, mm -hmm. and and I had a something deep inside, I got a real inner thing, I know that is a wasted life. Mm -hmm. That is a wasted life. And that's when I got on the road to India. Mm -hmm. Then I said, okay, and, and I dropped everything. And in those, in those days, you could do it. I went overland to Afghanistan and all by myself. Um, but I needed, I needed some direction. And, and I think, um, Listening for that, or being open to listening to that, being being independent enough to make those decisions mm -hmm. for yourself, and being um, being courageous enough to leave behind what needs to be left behind. Yeah, that's really hard. Yeah, that's really hard. <clears throat> and I think maybe also when you're more my age, sort of. I can't believe it, but middle-ish age. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the idea of when it, you know, the example you have of the guy on the chariot sort of going, mm -hmm. taking, 
even when it's hard, having some sense and listening beyond the, you know, I think that what ends up happening, particularly in this cultural kind of moment mm. of, am I doing enough? Is that, have I really found it or have I settled or have I, you know, this idea of, I do know about why I'm mm -hmm. here, about, but that, that it's not always smooth sailing, <laughs> that there are, what it means to commit in that way, that I think we're also, the inclination is sort of to jump around, to, to sort of start a new thing, mm -hmm. or, and what that persistence and what it means about. But again, going back to the, the violence to the soul, that's strong language. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I mean, I wonder about that. Um, what, what gets, what gets corrupted or what, what part of the soul is affected when we, I know it's not a fair <laughs> question, but. What, what part of the soul, yeah. I, I don't know. It's very, it's hard to, um, I mean, these questions almost by definition become personal. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a wise, I'm not Socrates, I can't. <laughs> You know, but but I think you, if you if you listen and you and you're really honest with yourself, I know what I saw and and even now I sometimes see or think where you think, I'm really sorry that I did that. Or I'm I'm really sorry that I hurt that person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I meant that that isn't me. That that's not that's not me. Mm -hmm. And I did violence to myself. And maybe violence to another, to another person too. Um, that that extreme selfishness or or something, something like that. And you feel it when you've done violence to your soul. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. And what we do here at St. John's, the things we read. Um, Freshman year, I was, how many seniors say, okay, let's do freshman year all over again, yeah. you know, because that yeah. so much is, so much is there, you know, so much is there. But, yeah, I don't know what more to say about that. It seems to me, um, if you've done violence to your soul, you know, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know it, yeah. you know it. If you, if you have the courage to look at it and, and not, you know, not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have moved from um, thinking about an intentional community, a group of young people coming together, sort of um, idealistic in the name of sort of what it means to be in a, a thriving human community. Mm -hmm. And we've moved to thinking about self-knowledge and a complicated process of really facing who you are. Um, and so I guess I'm interested in thinking about how those fit together. It does seem like they should. And this actually yeah. goes to the Republic also, the idea of we think through the human soul at an individual level, and then we go to the level of the city that that, that book is yeah. structured in that way. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts about sort of where we've landed, <laughs> you know, where we came from, how they might inform each other? Yeah. Well, okay. This um, this community that I was a pioneer of, you could say, is is extremely flourishing. There are thousands of people there now. It's people from all over the, you know, ecologists from all over the world come to look at the trees and the forest and the animals and all that. Um, but it's not my place anymore. And. It's funny because I met my husband there, mm -hmm. and and we've often said to one another, we are part of that community. We always will be, but we don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's also um, that's a challenge, but it seems to me very important to be able to um, carry what you've learned or something <laughs> along with you as as you change in life, because that helps you make the decisions that might make you change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I have two daughters, that um, stepdaughters, that, that still live there and have decided to, have decided to stay there. Uh -huh. But it, it's not my place mm -hmm. anymore. Um, but the, yeah, you were, a, you were asking about, 
I guess it's by falling flat on your face that you really learn the most. And I and I must say, in the in that in that experiment, and and um, and maybe it's something to keep in mind even here at St. John's. I know I know for myself, is that um, I probably became very arrogant in thinking that I knew something, mm-hmm. and and there was a lot of tension there among people who thought they knew something better than you did. Yeah. And there were great rifts in the community and, and there still there still are. Um, and that, tra- that translates into the world. I don't know if I'm really ask, answering what you, what you, yeah. but. No, I think it, I, the idea that um, We might think, or just thinking about one's relationship to oneself Mm -hmm. and the kind of growing into oneself um, and that, as you've called it, it's a very personal Mm -hmm. experience and and essential to to being human in Mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And that that might align with uh, a project at some point and at some point of life and, and just speak to where you are, yeah. but knowing when it's time to move on. Yeah. And not having, I mean, you've said it can be disillusioning, but maybe yeah. also the most honest thing is to face that when that yeah. happens. Yeah. Um, that makes sense to me. Yeah, and maybe when you, when you um, dedicate yourself to some kind of project, no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be like an intentional community or something, that it, um, ideally, it's a project of love. Mm-hmm. It is a project of erotic love in mm-hmm. that in that sense, and um, that doesn't go away. That never goes away. So you you take that um, you you take that kind of deep love. I'm not talking about something sentimental. Mm-hmm. I think you carry that with you, or one should strive to carry that with you. Um, mm-hmm. As as you go on, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I th- I feel like our students, not just our students, we we tutors were so um, we're so fortunate to be here. I I'm so deeply grateful for that. I'm supposed to be retired, and I can't. <laughs> I just can't. I keep teaching. I just mm-hmm. keep teaching when I'm not traveling. I I love this place, and I know it's informed by um, experiences that I've had in the past that have also been experiences of, of dedication and love in in a certain way. And I and I feel that I've I've brought that here, but I feel we have an opportunity like that here. Yeah. And, but also, particularly for the students, for young people, they're going to leave it behind. But mm-hmm. I sure hope they, I sure hope they carry it, carry it with them. Yeah. You know, you've got to have, you've got to have faith in that. I think you know, life, life has a way of showing you where to go. Mm-hmm. You, you meet the right people. You fall in love with the right person. Yeah. You know. No, I, I appreciate that. I think it, it helps me think through sort of. The, you know, I was making the distinction between a community based in action and a community mm-hmm. based in thinking. But mm-hmm. what you've just said is you should love the community. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's right. That that I mean, it goes back to things that we were talking about mm-hmm. before, but something about a kind of profound, really a deep dedication, mm-hmm. not the sentimental kind of love mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. M- almost more than anything feels like that's the ground for making a community vital and not superficial and also enriching our lives in ways that you you will finish your education. Well, we, we are here, but the students yeah, will so, move well, on. But yeah. having had an experience that's actually dedicated to something that's bigger than they are, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a gift for us all. Yeah, yeah. And I think those texts that I was referring to, um, one of the, uh, the the deep philosophical things that it, that it's very almost technically worked out, but but um, is that is that there are three kinds of um, trajectories or paths or something like that, which are philosophy, love, and action, mm-hmm. 
And that, but actually every person has a mixture of all, of all three, and, but there's a place of all three and, and each of us will, will lean one, one way or the other. And so to think of St. John's as a kind of ivory tower or um, a, a running away from the world, I think it's completely wrong. It's an opportunity to pursue um, the path that, we, that we're offered to pursue here, which in, I think includes deep, deep introspection, philosophy, and love, and, and action. Mm -hmm. um, but, but just feeling that gratitude, that gratitude for that, and then, and then the challenge of figuring out what, what's your mixture, what's your dharma, how are you, how are you gonna mix those three? together. What an opportunity we have here, though, to, to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Patricia. It's been oh. lovely talking to you about all this. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.